today we're beginning the last of our um, series on build. This whole year of 2019, we've been focusing on the word build. Uh, we began the year building hope. Uh, then set term two was building people, and last term we confined ourselves to the book of Nehemiah as we looked at the whole focus of building together, and I hope you enjoyed that. Um, it's been our desire as leaders to um, have times during the year when we're just focusing on one book of the Bible and really digging deep into that. I think you'll see more of that uh, coming next year, but this term actually we're doing the same thing. Uh, we're confining ourselves to the book of Acts as we look at what it means to build the church. And so I'm launching that this morning, and right up until we start our Advent series in December, uh, looking forward to Christmas, uh, we'll be going through the book of Acts. So once again, um, if your devotional pattern uh, can make room for that, uh, maybe you want to just, uh, this term, um, look at the book of Acts, and you'll be sort of um, adding to what's preached here on Sunday, and adding to perhaps what your life group is doing together during the week. That would be fantastic. Um, so that's where we are, that's where we're going, we're going to the book of Acts and it's the starting point of course for the church, it's the birth of the church and uh, we all know that day when 3,000 people, wouldn't that be great to see that again, eh? bring back those things, God do again what you've done in the past, 3,000 people cut to the heart, repented and believed in the Lord Jesus Christ for their salvation, absolutely brilliant, it was the, the birth of the church, it was the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost when those 120 believers were just empowered and anointed um, to see the church birthed. And um, what's interesting though is that when I read that and I read uh, some of the other parts of Acts that I've been looking at, um, the context in which the Holy Spirit came was in a large part a context of the believers making the context, the environment in which the, the Holy Spirit came on that first, what we call Pentecost, of course it was a, already a celebration for the Jews, was a context or an environment largely of the believers making. Largely of the believers making. You and I can determine how much or how little of the Holy Spirit we want. Well, isn't that giving us too much credit? Isn't that giving us too much power? I know it sounds crazy. After all, the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Holy Trinity. He is Almighty God. And you're saying we can, we can affect... I mean, can't He go and do whatever He wants? Well, of course He can. Of course He can. But He chooses to go... Where He chooses to go and build can be determined by how ready we are to receive Him. You see, we have an influence over the environment and the context in which the Holy Spirit comes. And our readiness is determined by factors which we can be involved in and do personally, but also factors of which we can do together as the Church of Jesus Christ. And, and here's what I've found. We're generally very familiar with the things that we personally can do to create an environment where the Holy Spirit can come and fill us afresh. And I'll mention them shortly. But when it comes to those things that we can do together to invite the presence of the Holy Spirit and to remain full of Him, these things are under threat in the modern church. They're under threat. And I want to remind us of what they are this morning. Jesus once said to His disciples, "'Apart from Me, you can do nothing.'" And he was, he was talking about his soon uh, return to heaven, um, his going back to the Father and that they would receive the Holy Spirit. They would receive the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ in each of them by way of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit would be the presence of Christ with all who would believe in him. And without that presence, anything that the disciples would endeavor to do, anything that you and I would endeavor to do, even with godly intent, without the presence of the Holy Spirit in us, won't work. It's, it's a useless endeavor without the presence and the power of God with us. And I wonder what you think of when you think of building the church. Of late, my mind's been on an actual building. And, and property development, and I'm excited about that. And I don't, I don't know, in Tuesday week, we're going to walk on some land here at the Kalina Estate 
If you're traveling up from Coles towards Springfield Lakes, you'll see the water reservoir is now completely exposed. Have you noticed that? All the clearing that's happening and the the land we're going to be walking on, and we're not sure yet whether this is what God's leading us to, we're going to find out. But the, the land that we're walking on backs up against that reservoir. And I'm thinking that reservoir needs to be covered by a church. I don't want to look at that reservoir, I want to look at a church. But I'm sort of thinking, gee, it's nicely elevated, isn't it? As you drive up the street, whether you're coming up Panorama Drive, where Stuart's got some land now. How you going, mate? Good to see you here. Just been operated on, he's in church. Fantastic. Or whether you're coming up Springfield Lakes um, Boulevard, like Springfield Parkway, um, there's this reservoir, you can't miss it. And I'm thinking that God wants a, a form of water up there which is a little different from a round tank on a hill. Well, maybe. We'll see. We'll see. Um, we're, just, we're just sussing it out and seeking uh, the wisdom and provision of God in that. But that's where mind is. my mind is uh, often now with the, with the building. Of, but where does your mind go when we talk about building the church? Where is it going right now? Is it, does, it, does it mean to you that we'll see increased numbers as we come together on a Sunday? Is that what you think of when you think about building the church? Or, or do you think about building the quality of our praise and worship? Some of you have your head around that space, and, and that's a great space to be as well. Uh, if you're following out the Bible reading plan that we distributed, uh, you'll be in a space where the temple is being built by Solomon and all the, the lavishness and the decor and, and the sacrifice that, that came around that. Maybe, maybe building the church to you is seeing people dis- discipled and becoming more mature believers. Maybe it's having a great ministry team or a great life group. When you think building the church, maybe your head goes in that space. Well, the book of Acts provides us with a history of how the Christian church was birthed and began to be built. And, And this term we'll be focusing there to get an agreed understanding of what it is to build the church. So whatever you think building the church is, you can't get away from the fact that no building gets done physically, spiritually, or any other way unless what is happening is done in the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. Nothing, nothing gets built in the church without the Holy Spirit. And that's, of course, how it all began in the book of Acts. In short, building the church is a supernatural work that cannot be done on our good intentions alone. No matter how good our intentions are, without the power of the Holy Spirit you're going to come undone. It's unlike any activity, any other activity that we may be involved in and cannot be considered as part of a list of life obligations and, and, uh, and, and, and interests. It stands alone. Building the church is a work of God done through us. That's why Jesus said, I will build my church. And the miraculous thing is that he chooses to partner with us to get it done. I don't understand it. Why would you? But he does. He partners with us to get his church built. How could it be anything else but supernatural? Because when we're talking about the church, we're talking about really the body of Christ. It can't be anything else but supernatural. It can't be anything else but miraculous. And the spirit of Christ himself indwells that body. There's no way the body of Christ is going to be built on our good intentions, on our good deeds alone, on our good relationships, on our good worship or even our good preaching. The body of Christ will not be built like that. The church will not be built like that if it's without the power of the Holy Spirit and the presence and person of the Holy Spirit in it. Nothing less will do. So I want to look at some excerpts from Acts chapter 1 and 2. I'm not going to read all the, the whole chapters. I'm just going to take some parts out of it and, and look at, at the building of the church from its beginnings. And then I want to add a few verses from Ephesians chapter 5 that how the church corporately made room for the presence and filling of the Holy Spirit. So if you, you'll see it on the screen. I'm using the New Living Translation, but I'm going to be jumping around a bit. So maybe it's better just to keep your eyes on the screen today. So Acts chapter 1, verses 4 to 8, firstly. Uh, Once when he, Jesus, was eating with them, he commanded them, do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised, as I told you before. 
John baptized with water, but in just a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Then verse 14. They all met together and were constantly united in prayer, along with Mary, the mother of Jesus, several other women, and the brothers of Jesus. Then turning to Acts 2, the first four verses. On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place and suddenly there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them and everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. And then from verse 38, Peter replied, each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God. And be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is to you, I love this, to your children, to those far away, all who have been called by the Lord our God. Then Peter continued preaching for a long time, strongly urging all his listeners, save yourselves from this crooked generation. Save yourselves from this. We live in a crooked generation. It's not just Acts 1, Acts 2. It's now. Those who believed what Peter said were baptized and added to the church that day, about 3,000 in all. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. And a deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They, they sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshipped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved." And in those few verses from Ephesians 5, 18 to 21, don't be drunk with wine, because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves and making music to the Lord in your hearts and give thanks for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And further, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And these verses, wherever we find them, whether it's in the book of Acts or the book of Ephesians, have, have two things in common. And I'm, I'm sure you've picked up that they're, all of those verses I read are talking about the Holy Spirit, His coming and how to be filled with Him. But they also have in common one other thing. And it involves those who would receive the Holy Spirit and those who would be filled with Him. And it's the fact that they were together. All of those verses have that in common. They're about the Holy Spirit, but they're about the believers being together. When Jesus promised the Holy Spirit to his followers, they were together. When they were waiting to receive the promise of the Holy Spirit, they were constantly together. When they did finally receive the Holy Spirit, they were meeting together in one place. Then after Peter's sermon and the 3,000 believed, it describes what the church that had begun and was being built was like, and it says this, Four words appear repeatedly in Acts 2 verses 42 to 47 and they describe 10 times the context in which the Holy Spirit continued to fill and build the church. And those words are fellowship, sharing, met and together. Fellowship, sharing, met and together is the context in which the Holy Spirit comes and infills and builds the church. And I'm very aware of the things that we can do individually to create space for the Holy Spirit. I'm very aware of the the customs that we have, the habits that we have, that really say to the Holy Spirit, I want to be full of you. And they're great things. I used to pray for the Holy Spirit to fill me every day for a year, 365 days. I just thought to myself, I'm praying this whole year, every single day for the Holy Spirit to fill me. And it was not without effect. And I still regularly pray that prayer meditating on God's word, singing in private. Have you done that? People look over in the traffic. You're full of joy. With your eyes open, of course. 
singing praise and the Holy Spirit just fills your car, soaking in his presence. Have you, have you done that? Just, you know, agenda out. I am just about God right now. Being in the Word of God daily, putting into, in, in practice, putting into place the practices that invite the filling of the Holy Spirit, repenting of sin. Water baptism, the Bible tells us, opens the way for the Holy Spirit to come in. We're going to have that in two weeks' time. If you haven't been baptized or your children need to be baptized, start thinking about that now. It opens the way for the Holy Spirit to come and to fill. Praying in tongues invites the presence of the Holy Spirit. It's funny, isn't it, how the Holy Spirit gives things, and then as we use them, it actually invites Him to come again and fill us afresh. And I don't think Christians are unaware of these things. I'm seeing a lot of nods as I mention those, and I'm sure they're practices in your life, but here's my concern. If we only focus on what I personally am or am not doing as a Christian to welcome the fullness of the Holy Spirit, then I've actually missed the intent of his coming. If I only focus on what I do in the privacy of my car, home, room, whatever, if my only focus is, is about that, then I've missed the point. The intent of his coming. I'm not saying that won't fill you with, of course it will. But you'll never be as full of him as he wants you to be if all you focus on is what you do individually. See, whether it's the letters of Paul or the book of Acts, these words of God are directed at the church together. And as much as we personalize them to us, and it's right to do so, for each of us is a part of the body of Christ, let's not forget that the church together is the context for all that we've read about the Holy Spirit this morning. Jesus saves individuals, but he does so to build them into a body. The coming together of that body invites the filling of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to get a little serious and maybe a little confrontational. Is that okay? Really? Very good. Okay. You may feel convicted by some of this. Is that all right? It's not me, though. It's the Word of God. See, the Bible says that all Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching and training in righteousness. Isn't that wonderful? There's two words in between those two things, rebuking and correcting. It's also useful for that. So it's the Word of God. You see, the church is under threat from what is fast becoming a cultural norm in our society. And that cultural norm is individualism. And it manifests in so many ways. It indiv individually manifests in how we communicate with one another today. It, it manifests in how we entertain ourselves. As I looked across the heads in the aeroplane travelling back from Vietnam, everybody's got their own space, their own music, their own entertainment. There's nothing wrong with that necessarily. I'm just saying it's becoming a cultural norm. I remember the days of travelling in a plane when there was a, a TV set every fourth or fifth row and, and it was played over the speakers in the plane. No one, had, no one had these. You either liked it or you didn't, but it was on. I know. I'm not afraid of it, Stuart. But the chief way individual and individualism manifests is the belief that I am my own boss and I can do as I please. And tell me if you haven't heard these phrases before, it's my money, it's my body, it's my truth, I'll do as I please, thank you very much. Now I know that as Christians we would never say such things, but you know what we actually do? The only difference is we couch it in the words God told me. The following are all statements made by Christians in this church over the years to me. God told me to leave the church. God wants me to be happy, therefore I can leave my marriage. God told me it was okay to live together because it's just like marriage in front of his eyes. God told me to take a break from other Christians. Now I know how you might feel like that, but... And God provided the property that I'm now way beyond my means in repaying. 
God has brought me here to preach. Has he now? God has brought me here to lead worship. I've heard all of these. We give God the credit for a whole lot of stuff, which is just actually me wanting to be my own boss. And we should be very careful when we put those two words, God said, in front of anything. Because the Bible says God will not be mocked, a man will reap what he sows. That's why Christians who say that stuff actually never submit what they think God is saying to another brother or sister for counsel and input. Because the truth is that it's what they want to do and they're putting the rubber stamp of God on it. Or think they are. So although the personal ways of making room for and inviting the Holy Spirit in are valid and very necessary, that's not what I want to talk about in the remaining time that we have this morning. I want to remind us of the things that we can do together to prepare for and invite the fullness of the presence of Him who is building the church, who is the presence and power of Jesus Christ Himself, who is the head of the church, the one who will do supernatural things amongst us and equip us to be effective in our witnessing for him, for the gospel in our sphere. And of course, it's the Holy Spirit of God I'm talking about. And there are three things that I want to focus on this morning that together build a context and environment that the Holy Spirit wants to rush in and fill every vacant part. And those three things we find in Ephesians 5. It says there again, don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves and making music to the Lord in your hearts. And give thanks for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And further, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. You see, the fullness of the Holy Spirit in the church of Ephesus produced a singing church, a thankful church, and a submitted church. But here's the thing, when they began to do those things and continued to do those things, the Holy Spirit filled and refilled and built that church. What the Holy Spirit gave, he continues to be attracted to. Praise, thankfulness, and submission were also the ways by which the church in Ephesus remained full of the Holy Spirit. What did it say? Be filled with the Spirit, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves and making music to the Lord in your hearts. You see, the singing church will prepare the church for the infilling of the Holy Spirit. We were praising and worshipping God at the beginning of this service. You know what that does? When hearts are aligned with the same words, the same music towards the, the presence of God, He just rushes into that. And Pastor Jazz reminded us just a couple of weeks ago, an excellent message. And she preached about worship. And if you weren't here to hear it, do yourself a favor. Get onto YouTube, type in Pastor Jazz Morrison, and you'll find that message and it will do you good. Worship with music has its beginnings in heaven. It didn't begin here on earth. It began there amongst God and his angels. It's not our invention. God created it. It's the environment familiar to God. And he gave it to us as a gift to invite his presence to us. And worship with music and singing glorifies him. And it lifts him up and it magnifies him. But you know what else? Worship prepares each other for the filling of the Holy Spirit. It lifts God up and opens us up. It does two things at the same time. And that's what Paul was talking about to the Ephesian church. Another version of that same verse translates it like this. Speak to one another with psalms, hymns and songs from the Spirit. See, I love listening to praise and worship in the car or through my headphones in the quiet of my own personal space. But the Bible says that when you worship together, when you come together, that's just another level. That is just another level. You make each other ready for the Holy Spirit. How cool is that? You thought you were just singing with a bad voice to annoy other people. But what you're doing (laughs) is preparing them for the Holy Spirit. The church of Jesus Christ that we read about in the pages of the Bible knew nothing of the individualism we see today. 
They met together, they worshipped together, they shared together, and together they were filled with the Spirit. And as much as you can catch up on a message on YouTube, if you're not there on a Sunday, you can't worship with the church electronically. That just cannot be done. See, I wonder whether the more important things about what we do on a Sunday are the things that we do together. I mean, preaching's necessary, don't get me wrong. And testimony is necessary in our giving and communion message. It's all necessary. But unless we're involved with that, unless we're listening, unless we're taking it in, see, it's that, it's that when we do it together, the Holy Spirit gets involved. You see, comments like, I can catch up on the podcast. I can get what I need once or twice a month. I'm not being fed here. My life is too busy for church each week. That reflects the individualism of our society's culture. Phrases like that. It's all about I, 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 I. It's thinking that the church is about me and what I can get from it. Can I burst a bubble here? Is that all right? Church isn't about you. Church isn't about you. It's about God first and others. Church is about God and others. What you get is a byproduct of that. It's wonderful to get it as a byproduct, but it's a byproduct. It's not the reason why we meet together. We meet together for Him and one another. Some people say, Well, John, you have to be here. You're the pastor. You're paid to be here. (laughs) Come on, I know what's going on in your heads. Yeah. Well, Deb and I weren't always pastors. In fact, we train to be pastors in a mature age. But church has always been our commitment. Coming together with God's people has always been our priority. And when family or friends came to stay, we would invite them to church. And if they didn't want to come, we just told them where things were and we said, we're going, we'll see you afterwards. When people arranged things on a Sunday and invited us, we said, sure, we'll be there after church. We had the odd weekend away a couple of times a year and took annual holidays. But apart from that, we were in church because God and others had our priority and we made a commitment. We gave our children the same example because when we dedicated them, we would made promises to bring them up in the knowledge of the Lord. And we knew that church and sun kids would help them get the knowledge of the Lord that we promised to give them. See, I'm moving off the subject a little bit about a singing church, but let me diverge a little longer. If I have a list of things that I need to get done, and we all have those lists, whether you've written them down or they occupy your thoughts. If I have a list like that, and church is just one of the items on the list without more or less importance or priority, then I've failed to realise the supernatural, spirit-filling environment that I can come into once a week. I've failed to realise the importance of it. I've been together with my church family. And I know that life is busy. It's one of the most quoted reasons by pastors when they ask you about irregular church attendance, what do you think is the problem? And everybody's asking that question at the moment. I've said it myself, people's lives are too busy. I've said it myself. But in saying that as a reason why people are less in church these days, I'm actually agreeing that being in church with God's people is on the same level as everything else they might do in their lives. And the truth is it just isn't. It isn't. The singing church makes an environment ready for the Holy Spirit. There are not many things on your list that can do that. I love the worship in our church. Sometimes I come in here without peace in my spirit. Sometimes I come in here with disappointment on my heart. And let me tell you, without fail, worshipping God takes me to another place. Peace and healing come through the worship of God. And you know who works the peace and healing? It's the Holy Spirit. It just doesn't come out of thin air. He brings it. Secondly, the thanking church makes way for the Holy Spirit to fill us afresh. I love the opportunities we have for testimony. And we need to have more of them, actually. Just testimonies about what God's doing in your life. So we can thank God together for what he's doing in you. The Vietnam team are up here today. (laughs) God is just doing amazing things. You know, you saw those babies on the screen. Everything, every single one of those is a life saved. That would have been an aborted body had not Lifehouse begun their operations. Every single baby in that house is a life saved. 
And they want to build more houses and do this more and more in family environments. across. We can thank God for that. And when we do, it invites the presence of the Holy Spirit. But you know what? We can do it, we can do it corporately like this and, and in the run sheet. But you can do it far more casually than that. You know, before church, after church, during coffee time, during, during greeting time, just come armed with the question, what's God done in your life this past week that we can thank him for? Because we can talk about a whole manner of things. But just, you know, formulate the question, how are you, in a different way. What's God done in your life this past week that we can thank him for? You may just be responsible for pulling a person out of depression just by asking that question. Just by asking that. And lastly, the church that comes together and is, submit, is a church submitted to one another. It's not only resisting the cultural threat of individualism, but is making an environment worthy of the fullness of the Holy Spirit. And I've already spoken about this mutual submission to one another. But if you think you've heard from God in a particular area, don't be proud and think, well, I must have heard that right. Get some good counsel from a trusted brother or sister. Run it past someone who is likely to give you a straight answer and not just give you what, you think you, what they think you want to hear. Particularly when you believe in God's word agrees with what your flesh wants to do, watch out. Because I've found that what my flesh wants to do and God's word rarely agree. Can I ask the musicians to come back? Sorry, we've gone over time a little bit today, but we worshipped and we thank God. And His Holy Spirit's been here. Please, church family, please know that your leaders love you. And our desire is not only see you, to see you grow, but also to be blessed by God. And sometimes that requires difficult issues to be addressed. And today was one of those days. And this past term, we've seen attendances slip regularly on Sundays to levels we've not seen before. We're concerned about, we're not concerned about filling seats, we're concerned about your hearts being filled with the Holy Spirit. And God's word clearly speaks to the environment in which the Holy Spirit comes. It's the environment where we're together. Where we're together. Where we're singing songs and praising God. Where we're thanking God him for what's happening in one another's lives when we submit to another brother or sister in Christ what we think God is saying to us that the Holy Spirit loves that environment it's like a vacuum that he just wants to pour into he loves that environment I want you to give this message some thought and some self-examination over this coming week and just begin to seek God about it because there's no way I want to put greater burden on you I want to release you from burden but self-examination can lead to that. And think, you know what? How can I give greater priority to the gathering together of the saints? How can I do that? And believe God to lead you. Pastor Jazz told us about God's interest in the beginnings of journeys, and he is. Maybe your list is as long as my arm. Maybe you've got such busy lives and so many other commitments and I understand that. I really do. And maybe you don't know how it's going to work. I'm just saying, commit it to God. Because He wants to fill us together here. He will show you a way that it can work if you trust Him. Let's stand together. Father God, we're just so grateful that you want to have anything to do with us. And Lord Jesus, you, you want to partner with us to build the greatest thing that will ever be built on planet Earth, the body of Christ, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and like David, what, what's man that you're mindful of him? The son of man that you care for him. You made us a little lower than the angels and crowned us with glory and splendor. God, we thank you for blessing us, calling us, choosing us, providing Jesus for us, bringing us into a church family right here, a manifestation of the body of Christ here in 
greater Springfield. We thank you for that, Lord God. But we also know, Lord God, and confess that nothing can be done without the power of the Holy Spirit working in us. Nothing that's going to grow your kingdom, nothing that's going to um, see more of you in this place that we call our home. Nothing will happen without the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, we need, we need you. We don't understand why you want to make your home in us, but you do. You call us to sing and to, sing and to give thanks and to submit. And Lord God, as a church, we are going to do it. We want to see your power and presence here. We want to see the blessing of God on the unity of the saints. We want to see the power of God bringing forth miraculous solutions to the problems that we face. We want to see a praying church seeing real things done in people's lives in Jesus' name. We want to see courage grow in our hearts, Lord God, to make friends with the unbelieving neighbour or workmate that we have just so that we can share Jesus with them in some way. All of these things require your Holy Spirit and we say we need you. We need you, Holy Spirit. Right now I pray, flood and fill every heart. Flood and fill us. In Jesus' name. Amen.